Hey everyone, just giving you guys a heads up that I'm live streaming on Facebook uh, 10 minutes early, just so I can make sure everything's operational. Before we start, I'm going to put on a little bit of background music from uh, Michael Greenacre. I see him in the attendance. So thank you, Michael. Statistics, logistics, cladistics seem to me to have a common theme scientifically economists biologists with phd degrees they all need some proof of their theories a ladder is the key you'll see clearly not b nor g nor v but it's the P. There's no values like P values, like no values I know. Think of something that is not worth proving. That everyone calls now. If your P is too large to reject it, then your experiment is rather dull. There's no Try again with samples twice the size. Everything is possible. Be sad if your peace all in me. Put your faith in the peace. The F test, the Z test, the chi square, and the T. And other cryptic terminology. ANOVA regression test distribution free. They all need some sort of guarantee. So if you find a tiny FX size, the P value will be a good disguise there's no values like p values the frequent is zero when you get that data maudlin feeling but results you have are not all some 
stats that are appealing to show the journals your work is hard your work is hard there's no values like B values especially when they're low don't be sad Side. Everything is possible. Just trust in me. Put your faith in the peace. Put your faith in the peace. Put your faith. That was the P-Value song by Michael Greenacre. I left the uh, YouTube link in the comments on the Facebook stream if anybody wants to go and check that out. Kind of approaching the time now. So. I think we can probably get started earlier and I'll make some simple introductions. So, hey everyone, and thanks for joining. This is our first ever Ecology in our web conference series. Just to do a quick introduction of myself, uh, my name is Russell Gray. I'm an ecologist and R enthusiast like many of you. Um, back in 2019, I started this Ecology in R Facebook group to help R users in various fields of ecology and evolution connect with each other, share code, and solve problems. Uh, today, we have a little over 13,000 members, ranging from new R users to expert R users from around the world. Uh, this conference series is a product of the members of the group coming together and giving us some of the time out of their busy schedules to present their own research and our analysis skills. So I'm thankful for everybody who has uh, dedicated some time to being here today. During the past year with all the COVID lockdowns and quarantines, I personally spent a lot of my time watching webinars uh, and I've noticed a trend in many of them where the speakers have only a limited amount of time to talk, and that usually leads to rushing or a bit of stress for the speakers where there's like technical difficulties, which I expect sometime, some point in this week, it's probably gonna happen, so bear with us. Uh, so because of this, I wanna keep these talks as laid back as possible. So we don't put any stress on the speakers, we don't uh, have to worry about running into technical difficulties, and if we do, we'll resolve them as they come along. Um, so, and this also gives the speakers time so that they can speak slowly and clearly. Uh, I know we have a lot of non, non-native English speakers that are probably viewing, so that's probably going to help you guys as well. Uh, after the talks, we'll be doing a question answer session where the registered participants on the Zoom can uh, ask their questions in the Q&A dialog box. We ask that you please save your questions until after the speakers finish talking so they don't like pop up on the screen and distract them. Um, we'll also be live streaming the talks on the Ecology and R Facebook page. So uh, if we don't have too many questions on Zoom, I'll also go over to that and check if anybody has some questions there. Um, so when you put your questions in the dialog box, I'll read it out to the speaker just in case they don't see that. Uh, if there's too many, I'll just try to like grab one as, as they're going and then uh, they'll, they'll answer you as, as they can. 
So without a further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Alfredo Escanio from Miami University, USA. I'll uh, turn it over to you now, Alfredo. Well, thank you very much, Russell, and thanks for organizing this uh, like thread of talks. Um, let me share my screen. Can you guys see the presentation? Yep, I can see it good. OK. Um, well, first, I apologize. Uh, I'm a bit nervous. So when I'm nervous, I tend to talk uh, really quick. So I will try to uh, not do that today. Uh, I'll be presenting a, um, some work we developed while I was back in, in, in Venezuela around 2018 and 2019. Uh, and uh, we are going to deal more with the methodological aspects of it, but I wanted to tell kind of the story of how we reach the question uh, we will try to, to answer in here. So that's why the name of the presentation is, well, from corals to complex networks, uh, extending a measure of community assertivity. To begin, uh, we first need to define what a complex network is. So these tools are also called graphs. They are mathematical um, tools that help us visualize and analyze the components of a system and the way they interact with each other. The first element that will uh, be part of the network is what we call nodes or vertices, and they represent the system components themselves. These nodes can have uh, different attributes, uh, weights, uh, and some other variables uh, attached to them. The second element uh, of our network is going to be what we call links or edges, and they represent the interaction between the nodes. Uh, and these interactions can have direction, weights, and other attributes. To give you guys some examples, um, we can think about an ecological community, and each node representing a specific species within that community, or even a specific individual within that community. And then we can define what the interaction between those uh, nodes is. We can have a, a plant pollinator network in which the nodes are uh, plant species and animal species. And the interaction is um, which animals are pollinizing which uh, plant species. Uh, we can have food webs in which we have a, a very clear direction of the interaction and who predates on who, or um, we can shift that direction of the interaction to uh, address how the energy is flowing from one node to another. Um, then um, another example we can give is metabolic networks in which we can define the nodes as the different molecules within uh, that specific uh, system and the interaction being uh, how are they by products of each other. And within the, the, the complex network context, we can be interested uh, in knowing what are the characteristics of these networks, which are uh, the, the, the central nodes or the nodes that are more important to sustain the structure of our network, what are the, the edges or links that are more important to maintain that connectivity within our system, and so on. We have, a, a, there are a lot of different properties and characteristics of the network that we can uh, analyze. And for now, we will focus on uh, network clustering. So once we have uh, built a, a network, we can try to determine if there are groups of nodes that seem to be um, interacting more with a specific nodes than with others. So we can try to define uh, or, or, to, or to find some clusters within uh, a given network. These are also called communities in the graph theory or complex network theory context. There are multiple algorithms for clustering, uh, and they may depend on nodes, uh, edges, their different weights or attributes. And one of the problems or, or the main issue that we will talk about uh, later in this presentation is, well, how do we quantify the robustness of our community detection in a given network? Uh, in other words, uh, can the structure of a community arise at random within uh, the network that we build or not? And part of uh, how did we reach this specific question has to do with corals. So the, the first thing we tried to do and, and how we reached this problem was because we tried to build a, a coral disease research network. Uh, we wanted to make like a, a review in a, uh, using a different focus or a different scope. Um, 
So this work was actually published in 2019 under the name of Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of 50 Years of Oral Disease Research Visualized Through the Scope of Network Theory. Um, in this particular uh, work, we will, uh, we review a lot of uh, literature since like the 65, I think, uh, and we had around 700 or more papers. Um, and then we, we, we built a network uh, given um, some topics that appear in those uh, papers. So the first element of our networks were nodes, and these nodes represented research topics. And we had four categories of research topics. So we have coral disease that was studied in a given paper, the genus or the multiple genera that the study uh, tried to um, reach. If there was a sampling in a specific marine ecoregion, then we extract that uh, ecoregion. And what was the objective of the research? So whether to assess the effect of temperature in the progression of the disease or study the histopathology of a given disease on the coral tissue and so on. And the link for our network uh, was defined uh, by whether or not these nodes appear together in a given paper. So at the end, we had a weighted network uh, in which the, the, the weight of the different links depended on how many times across the research of coral diseases, um, two given nodes appear together in a paper. Uh, as an example, um, we can have uh, for uh, one study in here that, for example, was trying to determine the effect of temperature or, or to uh, assess or, or quantify the, the effect of temperature on the progression of yellow band disease in the genus Orbicella uh, with a sample uh, performed in the Southern Caribbean marine ecoregion. And we can have another paper that dealt with uh, the effect of temperature in the progression of another disease, the black band disease, in the same genus of coral, um, Orbicella, but in this case also in the, in the Floridian uh, marine ecoregion. At the end, our, our final network may look something like this, in which we have uh, or six different nodes, but then we have a stronger interaction between these two uh, nodes. So, the, one of the things we wanted to do with this particular network was use the clustering, uh, one, one clustering algorithm to determine uh, if there were uh, groups of research topics, so topics that were more commonly found between each other than uh, general, um, and were not like as general within the network. So for example, um, some objectives, the effect of temperature may not have been uh, studied in all the diseases with some specific ones. Uh, and so we can find also or detect absence of interactions between certain topics or groups of topics. One of the things we tried to do was to determine uh, what we call overlapping communities. We wanted to see um, communities in which a specific node can be shared between communities. Uh, and that's a difference from what we call discrete communities in which a node can only belong to one specific community. We consider that this was a, a more realistic approach to how the groups of research uh, in, 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 in coral disease uh, applied. So we, we thought this was a, a more realistic approach to this. So this uh, algorithm is implemented in the Lincoln R package and produces what we call link communities. So there are communities based on the links that the nodes had with each other. And again, they allow for uh, nodes uh, belonging to multiple communities. Um, we can see, this is an example um, before moving forward. This is an example of, of the actual network, but you can see that uh, trying to uh, address a network in its raw, pure form can be really messy. It's really hard to actually tell things apart. So uh, a bit of the of different visualizations we can make from that is uh, this plot in which we can see the, the 15 different clusters that we found in the previous network and how many nodes were shared between them uh, given by the, the weight of the edges. And this is another way to visualize uh, the network. Each of these columns represent uh, a given cluster, uh, and each of these rows represents a given node within our original network. So we can see that these allowed for overlapping uh, presence of a given node within different communities. And this may happen, um, for example, if we grab, if we grab white syndrome, uh, 
white syndrome might have been studied in different coral genera. So for example, in Acropora and Montipora uh, genus. Um, but then the objectives of the research in both uh, in these different uh, genera uh, might have been uh, very different across ecoregions or across uh, the, these particular uh, species. So that, that was one of the main reasons why we wanted uh, to see that uh, possibility of overlapping instead of assigning um, or constraining each node to just one specific community. So we go back to the problem that we mentioned at the beginning. So how robust was our community structure detected within the network using this algorithm? And different metrics to quantify this robustness or, or, or this um, randomness or non randomness in our community detection exist. Uh, for example, we have the network modularity, we have uh, the network community assertivity, and there are other metrics. The issue here was that these, uh, these indices or metrics were developed thinking on discrete communities. They don't really were made to account for overlapping uh, communities in a network. So the question was, well, can we apply one of these metrics or extend one of these metrics to overlapping communities? And then we, we focus on, on Chisuka and Farine uh, metric that's called community assertivity. From now on, I will call this RCOM. Uh, in their paper, they offer some supplementary materials uh, that contain the one script, one specific script that allows us to Kind of see what were the process, what was the process that they were making, and and try to implement it to our empirical network. Um, originally, this method is a, a bootstrap method, so it resamples the network multiple times and try to 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 find um, that that answer on on whether the community structure uh, can arise from random or not. The range of the metric goes between minus one and one. Uh, that's uh, the definition of assertivity, uh, the regional assertivity, and the implementation that Chisuka and Farina did uh, on their own community assertivity, in which one will represent a, a completely random assortment of nodes in cluster. Zero will represent a non-random assortment of nodes, organization of nodes within the cluster. So uh, whenever we detect uh, communities, we will like to have values as close to zero as possible. And they mentioned that in some rare occasions, we can find values lower than zero. This is kind of a, a rare thing because that means that in, in the different bootstrap resamples of the network, two nodes that appear together in the regional network um, will appear in completely different communities uh, in the bootstrap sample. So it's, it's like saying there is a possible uh, community structure, but it's completely different from what you saw in your empirical network. So how does this original uh, index uh, is made or, or works? First, they generate uh, a K number of bootstrap networks and apply the clustering algorithm to each of them. So in this case, when we make a bootstrap, a bootstrap of the network, some nodes and some edges may disappear. No new edges will be created. That's one of the constraints. So we are only um, changing the number of nodes and the, the strength of the interaction between them, but not creating new interactions between the nodes. And then they try to um, build uh, three matrices, mainly that, uh, that matrix that we will call PIJ. So, this matrix uh, comes from, or results from uh, using this MIJ matrix. This is a co-membership matrix that results from each bootstrap network in which uh, each pair of nodes will have a one, a value of one, whenever they share the same community in a bootstrap network and zero whenever they don't share that uh, community. And then for that same bootstrap network, we will produce a CIJ uh, matrix that also called the co-occurrence co uh, matrix in which uh, what we are trying to, to assess here is whether or not two nodes appear in a network, regardless of whether they uh, are members of the same community or not. So at the end, 
or PIJ matrix is going to represent the proportions of times any pair of nodes appear together in the same community along the different bootstrap uh, samples. From this, the metric from Chisuka uh, is constructed using uh, these terms. So it's e, uh, a term that I call EXX for simplification sake, uh, minus uh, the square of EXY over the uh, one minus uh, E square, EXY squared. And I will explain a bit of what, what are these terms referring to after we find our, our proportion matrix. So where, where CX and CY are the empirical communities, or two empirical communities, let's say CX is this um, community to the left and CY is this community to the right. Um, e, the term EXX will represent the sum of edge proportions that appear or that go from a node in the community X to a node in that same community X. So across the full network, we will assume we will assume the edge proportions that go uh, or that appear within a specific network, uh, within a specific uh, community. And then our other term will represent the edge proportions going from a node in a community X to a node in a different community, for example, community Y in this case. So why might we need to extend this measure of RCOM or community assertivity for overlapping communities. So the thing is that we, we actually try, the first thing we tried to do was use try, uh, apply it to our, our cluster detection or in, in with link communities. We tried to do that. And there were some, some issues that happened. So um, from what I remember, one of the things was that the value of RCOM fall, fell outside of the intended range of minus one and one, which uh, makes the interpretation of these results uh, very difficult. So we, we, we don't know in, in this case, whenever uh, we're outside of the range, uh, what is a, a, a community, that, a structure that arises completely at random and what is not uh, at random in, in a range outside minus one and one. So we try to think why this is happening. What is the issue uh, that is causing this to fall outside of the range? How can we correct? How can we make a correction to these terms to, to have or retain the same possible interpretation of these results? So one thing we noticed was that using the same uh, script from Chisuka, what was happening in, with overlapping communities what the, was that we were counting edges multiple times. So for example, imagine that this node uh, belongs to the three communities that we see in this in this plot. So this belongs to the community above, to the community to the left, and to the community to uh, and the community below. So whenever we count this edge, this edge counts as an as an edge between community one and also an edge between community one and two and community one and three. So we are counting multiple times just one thing, and as we are dealing with proportions, then this is basically harming or calculation of the proportions uh, or the sum of the proportions. So we try to think like, how can we correct this, um, these terms that deal with sum of proportions here? And we, what we did was kind of go back to the basics, but no trivial stuff in, in, in stats. Um, so let's just remember that whenever we have two set of events, events uh, A and events e, uh, B, uh, that are not completely independent of each other, so there may be elements that belong to the two groups at the same time, we need to account for that intersection whenever we're trying to sum the probabilities of those two events. So in general, this seems something like this. Whenever we try to join those probabilities, we need to sum the probability of the events in A plus the probability of the events, the events in B, and then subtract the probability of the intersection once. So we are only counting the elements present in that group one time. So we implemented this correction into several functions in order to calculate an extended version uh, of community assertivity uh, based on what Chisuka and Farine offer in their original supplementary material. The thing is that this was uh, a really tricky thing to do. Uh, and I didn't know at the beginning a lot of the math behind this thing. 
so the issue was, okay, what happens when we increase the number of clusters that, that could have overlapping edges between them? So remember that at least in our empirical network of coral disease research, we found, we found up to 15 different communities and we can have any degree of overlapping with, between those communities. So we are increasing the number of possible intersections between groups. And the thing that happens when we add or increase the number of, of, of overlaps or intersections in this is that the correction terms becomes increasingly complex. So first we needed to subtract that intersection once, but now we need to subtract these intersections uh, altogether. And then we need to sum again a bit uh, of the information because we subtracted too much. So imagine doing this with a possible combination of 15 or more clusters. So we wanted to also like develop a method that could be uh, used in, uh, in general for other uh, networks and not only for our own coral disease research network. After we implemented this, uh, this correction to the Chisuka and Farina terms for community assertivity, we tried to make some comparisons to, to kind of assess the, the consistency between uh, our measure and Farina's measure. So we grab around 19 empirical networks and perform a discrete community uh, detection to use with the Chisuka and Farina RCOM. And we use overlapping counterparts for our extended ARCOM calculation. And at the beginning, we, we saw uh, some consistency between the two metrics. One thing that you, can, that you can see here is that the range in which the values appear seems to be a, a bit different. They, they are still contained between uh, minus one on one or zero on one. We couldn't find an ex a strict example of that rare a scenario in which the, the community assertivity could be negative. Um, but you see how this uh, goes as, as low as 0.2 or, or less. And in our case, it goes around 0.3 something. Uh, so that's uh, things that we couldn't understand completely from our, the behavior of our metric. And we also know that we may be comparing uh, apples and oranges with this uh, uh, particular uh, comparison we were, we were doing. We didn't have a point of comparison for overlapping communities consistency. Uh, so this is the, the best we could thought, we could thought uh, at that moment in time. And well, just to, to finish, uh, here's some caveats that we saw and next steps to, to, to do possibly, uh, well, to deal with some conceptual limitations. I think that more theoretical discussion may be needed regarding or proposed, or, or proposed correction to the term are uh, to the terms in, in within the community assertivity proposed by Shizuka and Farine in 2016. Um, also, other indices or, or, or metrics may be adapted for overlapping communities, such as the case uh, of extended modularity proposed by Nicosia et al. in 2009. The thing is that this works very differently from um, from the community detection that, that we apply. They offer their own community detection algorithm. Uh, and is, if I remember correctly, um, they basically do like an optimization problem, which they try to maximize the modularity of the network uh, given um, the overlapping clusters they detect. So it's, it's a very different approach from what we're trying to, to do. And then we can we need to deal with some computational limitations. So as, as the number of detected uh, overlapping communities increase in a network and the networks uh, become becomes bigger, then determining all the possible intersection of edges requires greater computing power, and and that may take a lot of time. And last, some R limitations is uh, or where. Uh, the lack of implementations of some of the available indices of community robustness in, in, in complex networks. So the, there, wa there was a lot of functions that, that we didn't, uh, uh, or that we felt were lacking uh, when we studied other, other community um, kind of robustness uh, quantities or that were implemented in R at the time. Also, there, there were no standard package containing all the, the, the available functions. And this difficulty integration between algorithms dealing with community detections and those dealing with the robustness uh, quantification. 
So some of them require different objects that appear in specific pack, uh, packages dealing with networks uh, and so on. So yeah, th this makes uh, uh, this makes that functions in different packages might require different uh, R objects in particular. And I think that's that's all that I have for you today. Uh, thanks for your attention. Please ask any question. And you can go to uh, the GitHub of our project and check all the things we, we did uh, or to the paper and you can find all the process on how to build that specific network. I think we, we put all the, the data available in GitHub to replicate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so does anybody have any questions? Just to let everybody know, uh, I am monitoring both Zoom and Facebook right now. So if you have any questions over on the Facebook feed, please let me know as well. well while we're waiting for people to type out questions, uh, I did have one myself on the okay. RCOM. Uh, when you described you K cluster and bootstrap, um, do you, you said that you generate random nodes, correct? Random node connections. It's, it's what, what, it, what we actually did did more than this. Like we tried to implement some permutation of, of or or a metric to assess uh, randomness given permutation of links. Right. But the original method doesn't permute links. What it does is makes a bootstrap of the of the network. So it's basically resampling the nodes. Okay. So no, no new connections may appear in the, in the bootstrap method. Uh, what may change is uh, whether or not a node appears and thus an edge may disappear or the weight of that edge, the, the strength of that interaction may be uh, lower than the empirical network. Ah, okay. That's what the, the original method proposed by, by Chisuka with the bootstrap. And does this uh, hold true across each of the clusters individually or each of the nodes individually, or are all of them in the same sort of iteration of randomness? Uh, I, I think I don't understand the question. Can you, can you? Uh, so you check for randomness and each of these nodes through the iterations of the bootstrap uh, either loses or gains an edge. A am I understanding that correct? Well, they they can they can lose a strength of the interaction, uh, kind of at random, depending on on the bootstrap resampling. Okay. Okay. So no new connections may appear in this. We try to we try. I remember I remember that we tried to 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 do a, a, like a, a different hypothesis, basically of randomness. So like what what could happen if we have the same uh, nodes with the, with those uh, attributes uh, and kind of the same links. But what if we permute the links? Do, will, will we find um, a, a similar community structure or not, given uh, similar nodes and, and, and random links between those nodes, uh, keeping the weights? So uh, yeah, that's we, we tried to do that. But I, for this, I wanted to like keep the things as standard with the bootstrap uh, that, that they used at the beginning. OK. Thank you. That that definitely answers my question. We have another one from uh, Edward on Facebook who asks, where do you find the locations or coordinates for doing the analysis? Um, I'm, okay, can you repeat that? Uh, I'm not sure I, I myself understand. He says, where do you find the locations or coordinates for doing the analysis? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I thought it was a lot of a lot of like manual work. So uh, we just went to the paper and tried to, to see which which was the side of the country or, or the country or something that in, in which the sample was made, uh, and that was for for the eco regions. I don't know if you're asking uh, about the the coral part of the network part, um, but at least for the eco region, we just went to the paper and and kind of. Uh, assess uh, the, the country and then there is another paper that offers the marine regions of the world and we just match uh, those things so we we have the the standard marine regions rather than a specific coordinate for each uh, paper 
Okay, and we have another question from one of the attendees on Zoom who say, uh, it was a very interesting presentation, thanks. So they're thanking you. And you said that in the iterations, the strength of interactions changed too. Do you ensure that all nodes have at least one connection? No, that, that's the thing. Like some nodes in, in the bootstrap method, uh, the original bootstrap method, some nodes might disappear. It's like in this animation that I put here, like if we do this, the bootstrap resampling, we may, we may uh, not sample like this a specific node, for example, may not be a part of our bootstrap, of our K bootstrap. So when that happens, those edges with other nodes also disappear. So that, that's part of, of what's allowed in, 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 in the bootstrap. Okay, and we have uh, another question from Augustine on Facebook who asks, is it possible to test other mechanisms structuring the communities, for example, abundance or any other node trait? Well, yeah, like all the other measures, for example, I think modularity or the, the original assertivity, there is a, a measure uh, that, that measures like the property of the, of the network called assertivity, aside from community assertivity. And, and that, for example, tests nodes that are similar. Um, like it states that nodes will be connected mostly with other similar nodes. And you basically can define what the similarity is. So uh, for example, you can, you can do that with abundance of populations. So maybe populations that are really big will be really connected with populations, with other populations that are really big. And then the smaller populations we have uh, will have less uh, connections with other uh, bigger or smaller populations. Uh, in, in if we are talking about nodes as population, for ex in, in an ecological example, and uh, those matrix those uh, met metrics or quantities do exist. Okay. Um... Yeah. Yeah, someone is saying okay. the, the co-occurrence matrix makes so much. Yeah, that's that's the issue uh, with this. I was sorry, I didn't put that in the presentation, but uh, I was a bit tired ma making this at the end. So yeah, that that's basically why we have for each bootstrap we have a, a co-occurrence matrix and a co-membership matrix because we are basically assessing uh, whether or not the the two the, the the pair of nodes appear together in the bootstrap and whether or not they are together in one community in that bootstrap. So any any tips? Uh, I think when I started with networks, right now I'm not working as much uh, with networks in, in my PhD. I'm doing something different. But when I started with networks, I went to the Barabasi book that I, I don't know if you if you catch the, the citation I put at the very beginning. Um, I would try to share this presentation. Uh, but I, and at the end, I have some some references of, of this. So I will recommend to go or to start reading uh, this book from um, Laszlo Barabasi that's called Network Science. This is openly available in, 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 in the internet. Like he has a, a web version of this book. So he goes from the beginning of what a complex network is and all the possibilities um, for, for like basic and not so basic analysis. Uh, it's, it's a very wide subject. Okay, so I think that might be it for the, the questions. If there's any more, please feel free to ask before we move on. I'll give it another little bit. Oh, uh, do you see the other question? Yeah, I from... think, uh, suppose I want to see relation, the relation how feeding guild of beer community interacting with each other in different habitat, does some, somebody need presence, absence or abundance data for network analysis? Like um, uh, in, in, my, in my undergrad uh, thesis, I did some food webs. Um, and in, in that case, I, I just put the presence of the interaction and try to uh, and the and the, the direction of the interaction. So who, which species were eating or which groups 
were eating which other uh, prey items. Um, and you can do something like a, a basic, again, basic doesn't mean trivial. It, it takes a, a bit of time, but like um, a basic simulation of, um, so we, we have, for example, let's say we, we have a measure of connectivity in networks. There is a connectivity or connectance uh, property of the network and you can measure that uh, quantity. So you can make a simulation in which you uh, drop one node at a time from the network. So you drop this node and see how much the connectivity of your network changes. Uh, so was the, the connectivity dropping a lot? Or did the connectivity for some reason increase? Uh, did it remain kind of the same? And you can kind of uh, measure which, uh, in, in that basic network structure, which uh, group, guild, or species seems to be uh, the, more, the most important one to maintain the connectivity within your network. And there are other more complex simulations of like secondary extinctions. And there are a lot of papers in, in food webs that you, that you can make. I don't know if that, that answers your, your question, uh, but you can do that with a, a presence absence of the interaction. Uh, you may do more complex simulations adding all well the strength, like how much this guild is eating this other guild. And, and you can add like that uh, attribute of, well, how much energy from the ecosystem overall is passing from one group to another. Like this can get really, really uh, complex. I'm working on a pollination network. There, there is another question that says, I'm working on a pollination network and I want to draw a network, but it's too much. Uh, oh, have that off entire city. Uh, I think I, I don't understand your, your question, Kamal, sorry. Um, but for, for uh, plant pollinator networks, uh, I, I think you can use what we call a bipartite, a bipartite network. I don't know uh, if I'm pronouncing that right. I will make just a note, a really quick note here. It's called Viper type network. And I think my, my the, the other panelist that's coincidentally also like he was the, the, the first author on the Coral uh, Research Network disease paper. Um, uh, he will present something relating to like a Viper, uh, a Viper type network. Uh, so you may search how to organize your data in, in, in that way. Uh, I don't know if, if, if that helps uh, too much or not. Okay, so I think we'll take one more question if we have it and then move on to our next speaker. Anyone else? Okay. So um, our next speaker is Louis Montilla from Anton Dorn Zoological Station, Italy. And I will let him do the introductions for himself. Are you ready, uh, Louis? Sure, just let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, okay, <clears throat> this should work. Okay, can you see my presentation? I can see uh, slides in what looks like an editor. Oh, okay, so it's switched. Okay, and now? No. No? No, okay. Let's unplug this. Uh, okay, just a second, please. We have lots of time, don't worry. Okay, hang now. Maybe you are sharing the, like the only that uh, window instead of the screen. Ah, yeah, it's possible. Oops. Ugh. Am I out of the presentation? No, no, no. It's uh, it's just showing the 
like PowerPoint screen, but it's not full screen yet. Yeah, I want to. Okay, how about now? Nope, same screen. No? Okay, let me. Okay. And now? Oh. Same. <laughs> you should just uh, stop sharing and, and try again. Yes. Uh, Oh, I see. I'm going to share this and now. Okay. Can you see it? Yep, you got it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, thank you everybody for uh, having us. I'm Luis Montilla. I'm a PhD student at the Stazione Zoologica Canton Dorm in Naples, Italy. And I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit also about networks in uh, marine ecosystems. And specifically, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a little idea that we had to uh, uh, create this uh, network of invertebrate and microbe associations in seagrass beds. That it's part of my research project. So to give you a little bit more of context, uh, I'm interested now in working it with uh, coastal marine ecosystems, which are very important because uh, they act as hotspots of nutrient cycling. Uh, in particular, for example, nitrogen, which is my, my main interest now. And one of the most interesting interactions that you can find in, in these ecosystems uh, are uh, what basically the interactions of uh, macrofauna with the sediment and with the microbiome or the microbiota that you can find either as free living microorganisms in the sediment or also as symbionts. Uh, in particular, because uh, these organisms uh, can create different fluxes of uh, gases, of uh, fluids in the sediment. So you are, or they are basically altering the, the different processes that uh, can happen here. Uh, several of these uh, interactions are um, very well studied in organisms like uh, Lucianid bivalves and different godlets uh, worms. However, for a review that we are preparing now, uh, we were interested in trying to find out a pattern uh, using a, a more extensive data that, that was already available. Uh, so this is why I propose to uh, try to uh, prepare an, uh, a bipartite network of, of these associations. And now I will tell you a little bit the story about uh, well, the kind of uh, setbacks that we found in the way and how we solve them. So the first step for this is, well, having an idea of what we want to get. Uh, this is a, let's say, a, a random bipartite network. You can have an idea of the nodes on the bottom as the hosts, and then nodes on the top as the symbionts. And the connection between them could be their, their cooperation in a database or a paper where they are reported. So uh, the first step to create this network will be was to um, create a, an, an inventory or a list of invertebrates. In this case, our first approach was to compile a list of dominant invertebrates for, uh, from Mediterranean sea grasses. Uh, so as a, started, a starting point, we had uh, a 291 invertebrates. And to find uh, who was associated with them, uh, we went to the NCBA database which is a, a real extensive database where you can find genetic uh, data associated with all kind of uh, organisms and, and the data associated with a lot of papers. And this database is really, really uh, helpful and, and easy to use. You can see here an example where you just uh, type one, a given genus of invertebrate. In this case, I was using Loripes. Uh, plus a group of interests, in this case, for example, bacteria, and you will have a, a list of entries with genetic information and a lot of metadata that you can easily download to your computer. So, of course, uh, 
thinking about the principle of don't repeat yourself that we, we use in coding, uh, the idea will be not to use manually download or, in, or, or even perform the search for all of these 291 invertebrates. So in R, uh, I found that, that the package Rentres uh, was providing a, a lot of functionality to connect this database with the code that we wanted to uh, apply and basically perform all the, download all the data uh, automatically or more or less automatically. And this is where it starts to, to become interesting because we found the first setback. Uh, the information that we specifically wanted was coded in, uh, as a specific qualifier in the database. So you can see here uh, an example of a very specific uh, result also from Loripes. So you can see that all the keys are very well defined. But then we were interested in this key that you will find here at the bottom uh, called host. So this key is typed inside the features section, which is uh, also nested within the source section. Uh, so this is more, more or less complicated to, to retrieve from the, the code that the renters package was allowing us to do. But we went on because basically uh, at this stage we were retrieving the data. So to perform the automation, we wrote a more or less simple loop. Basically we were uh, using the, the function to retrieve all this data to all of the, the genera that we compiled and storing all of this information in a variable. So, so far so good. And then we were repeating this for all of the five groups of uh, symbionts that we were interested into. Uh, for example, bacteria, archaea, viruses, fungi, and eukaryota. Now, one of the interesting things now is that uh, we were also retrieving information about organisms that were, that were with zero information. Uh, for some reason, the functionality of the code uh, when you ask information about certain uh, invertebrates, if there is nothing in the database, they will also retrieve this object, this gene bank object, and it, and it will also store it in your environment, uh, occupying memory and space and everything. Uh, so of course, one of the first things were, was to, we needed to deal with this. And also one interesting result that we are finding at this stage is that uh, from the original list of invertebrates, 210 didn't, uh, weren't, weren't appearing in the database. So after filtering, we were only uh, having 28% of the original list of, of uh, macrofauna. And this was for the first stage that was basically retrieving the gene bank files from the database. Um, additionally, uh, some of, uh, of the other organisms had a, a, a huge amount of information, which you can see here as uh, having uh, over 900 or, or, or way more entries for, for each of them, which was also occupying a lot of memory in a desktop, 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 desktop computer. So uh, it was very complicated to work with this. And the solution that we decided to use was basically uh, after writing this in our environment, writing the files in the disk, which was the, the second step. Uh, for this, we also, uh, we also had to use a, a, a manual step because these particularly large files, uh, it, it was easier for us to uh, go back to the original database, to the NCBA database through the web browser and download everything by hand because uh, the number was uh, relatively slow. It was uh, around 10 or 10 genera. So we decided to use that approach because we also had, we, we, were, we were able to identify this, this list of, of invertebrates. So you can see here an idea of the input or the output, sorry, in the, in the R console. As you can see, the file is not uh, necessarily well organized. Uh, and here you can see that one of the interesting topics of this is that 
uh, we are also uh, downloading all the genetic information of the genetic sequences of related to these organisms, which uh, is not necessarily of our interest now, but it was something that we had to deal with. And somewhere in the middle of the file, we had the, the host information that is what we wanted to get. So one possibility in the future is that maybe we can try to extract this information using uh, regular expressions, but at the moment, when we were starting to do this, uh, we decided to go on with the more traditional approaches. So now that we retrieved the GeneBank files and wrote them to disk, we went to the uh, following step. Ah, in this, uh, first of all, uh, let me show you this is an idea of how much information we were uh, having for this more or less small list of invertebrates. We were having over uh, 160 gigabytes of information, uh, partially because all the genetic information that we were, that was associated to the gene bank files. But in any case, we had all the files written in the hard drive. So the next step was uh, trying to transform the original file that you can see on top to an ecological matrix where we had all the rows uh, samples and the columns of the taxonomical groups that we were uh, researching. Now, uh, manipulating these files within R wasn't necessarily trivial, or at least not at the moment when we were, we were trying to do this. So one of the easiest and also the fastest way to solve this issue was to use an external software. In this case, we found that the program called uh, gvk 2 fast which is from uh, this author and you can uh, download it freely in, in this address, was specifically designed to perform these transformations. Uh, however, we, there is also a new setback. Uh, you, if you go to the website, you will see that uh, there are two different versions. Uh, one that is called by the author the old version and let's say the new standard version. So if you are working on Linux, and if you try to use the new version, you will see that it depends on a library that it's either deprecated or it's not working, but uh, I, I, could, I couldn't find any way of using it. So I switch to the what the author calls the old version and it worked on li in Linux, but uh, it didn't provide all the metadata that uh, I wanted specifically, the host information. So in the end, the solution was to switch to Windows and use the new version. And then at that stage, I could have the uh, ecological matrix with all the files merged in a single matrix. So then now that we have this uh, matrix, we, need, we needed to re-import these two R. Uh, you can see here in the environment, uh, an idea of the size of this matrix, which was basically over a million and seventy hundred thousand rows. It was ex extremely huge. Uh, but of course, we were expecting this that also, and we were also expecting that the, the final data set was uh, smaller because we were expecting to do some cleaning. So the first stage was to uh, clean the information about the host. We were verifying the, the, the taxonomical uh, validity of the names. Uh, we, for this, we were using the package worms, which lets uh, let us perform queries to the World Marine Register of uh, Marine Species. And when we were performing this uh, cleaning of the hosts, uh, for example, one of the cases that, 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 or one of the issues that we found was that uh, some of the rows had the, the column host, uh, a value called unknown. So we were, when we were exploring what was the reason for this, we, we noticed that this, uh, the original search was retrieving information from plants and vertebrates and other organisms that we were not interested into. Uh, so we proceeded to perform the cleaning uh, excluding all non-marine organisms and then after that all the marine organisms that were out of our scope like coral, sponges, algae and several other things. Then if we had to clean the host, we also had to clean the, uh, the symbionts 
which in this case, uh, what we had to do was to uh, bring everything to the lowest taxonomical resolution and also the, the a taxonomical resolution that was more or less common to all the different groups. Uh, of course, it wasn't possible for all the five large categories that we had, but uh, well, we had to uh, reach a compromise here. So in any case, uh, our final file had 39,000 rows, which was less than 3% of the original database. So uh, that gave us an idea that the so far the approach is not necessarily the most efficient. Uh, it's performing the work, but it has a lot of room for, for improvement. So we were then we were using the package iGraph to start to actually build the networks. Uh, so if you, you can see here the original hypothetical network that we were envisioning, and on, on your bottom right, you will see the, the actual network that is derived from the data. Don't pay too much, uh, too much attention to the names that, of course, the resolution doesn't allow it to. Uh, but you can see in the bottom nodes uh, that there are two different colors. This is because we also started to add some attributes. In this case, the red and blue color means uh, that the organisms are either epifaunal or infaunal. And this is particularly important to us because depending if the organism is living on top of the sediment or within the sediment, it can be associated with very particular uh, mi microorganisms. And of course, the processes that they are uh, participating into are also very, could be very, very different. Uh, next, now that we have the network, we wanted to improve a little bit the, the, the overall aspect. So for that, uh, we decided to use the package zero class, which uh, allows us to perform to or to build these uh, core diagrams. And I will show you the overall aspect of the network so far. This is a network that is uh, represented by 112 nodes, from which 53 are in uh, 53 invertebrate genera. 21 are epifaunal and 32 are infaunal organisms. And of these nodes, uh, 59 are microbial groups. Uh, once again, I call them microbial groups because not all of them have the same uh, taxonomical resolution. But I can tell you that, for example, 28 are bacterial nodes, uh, 17 are eukaryotes, 13 are viruses. And one interesting thing is that only one node corresponded to Archaeus. Uh, you can see here the, the tracks for these groups. And then we can plot nicely the different uh, interactions. Uh, so of course, this is more or less an exploratory uh, visualization. But even at this stage, we can start envisioning a couple of a, a couple of patterns. For example, you can see that the edges or the links in red color that represent the epifaunal organisms seem to be mostly connected to eukaryotes. And there are also some other interesting things like, for example, the bacterial class gamma proteobacteria is very dominating in the bacterial groups. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is a, a visual exploration. If we want to draw uh, proper conclusions from this, we need to uh, perform any uh, quantitative analysis. So we try to, uh, for now, perform a, a community analysis as Alfredo was describing before me. Uh, at the moment, we are only performing discrete communities analysis uh, because it's very preliminary. But even at this stage, we are finding some very interesting things. Uh, we found eight different groups within this network. Uh, I'm not going to extend in all, to all of that. Uh, but I will show you two of the most extreme cases that we found, so you can have an idea of the results. One of the communities that we found, for example, was constituted by only one uh, invertebrate host, in this case, the the sea urchin of the genus Echinocardium, which was uh, connected to this more or less large diversity of uh, microbial symbionts. 
which is probably giving us an idea of uh, uh, not very intimate symbiosis that this is probably a community that is linked to the organism, but not necessarily very interdependent. And then on the other hand, or on the other extreme, we found this other community where you can see that uh, there is uh, also a large range of uh, invertebrate hosts that are connected basically with this specific group of, of bacteria, of, of gamma proteobacteria. And if we pay a little bit of attention to the names that we can find here, we, in, if you are working in this field, you will be able to recognize some of the model organisms that are typically studied and found and, and are recognized as organisms that are highly dependent of the gamma proteobacteria for their metabolism in anoxic areas. So for now, uh, well, this is what we have in the next steps uh, are basically to expand this search to include uh, invertebrate hosts from other marine ecoregions of the world. Uh, ideally, we would want to uh, add additional attributes to the network to perform uh, more uh, complex communities. And of course, uh, it, is, it is of my interest to uh, optimize the code and there are some promising steps in that direction. I found this uh, package called Biofiles, which uh, has the, the, the main advantage that it's letting the user to uh, exploring in much more detail the table of attributes. And in this case, it, it's giving access to, for example, the host information that is what we wanted. So we can probably uh, perform all of this search excluding all the information that it's not uh, relevant to us. And with that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. And I will try to answer all your questions if there is any. Thank you. Thanks for presenting. Uh, <laughs> I can say from experience dealing with some of uh, like the newer and a little bit more messy APIs, I've also had that issue where you get like a return with just massive, massive amounts of information. And I've tried to deal with it through regular expressions, but I couldn't find a way to automate it in a way that would work for every single query that you ran. So <laughs> I'm glad that you you did this work. Yeah, it was not easy, but well, so far we have a, a, a product that we can use to, to actually analyze the data. All right, so uh, any questions from any of the attendees, either here on Zoom or on Facebook? I'm monitoring both at the moment. Mm. And I guess somebody is posting spam to the Facebook feed. So sorry about that, <laughs> everybody. <laughs> it's bound to happen when you have an open group. That's unfortunate. Don't click on their links. Um, give it some time. There's a little bit of a lag between the feed here and Facebook as well. Sure. Again, for anybody watching on Zoom or on Facebook, we can take some questions now. Uh, I know big data stuff is pretty complex and not a lot of people are getting into it yet, but. Yeah, it can be intimidating at the, at the, in the beginning. Yeah, for sure. Well, I can start it off. Uh, it, did you have to use uh, an HPC for for your work? Um, did you do it in smaller increments while you were writing the code uh, and running it? Or did you just have a computer that was memory intensive enough to, to carry all that data without R crashing on you every second? Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, I had to optimize a little bit the code because 
uh, in the beginning, I was just trying to perform all the search and download everything. And of course, the uh, uh, R was crashing very frequently. So I had to divide uh, eventually the code in uh, smaller chunks that were more efficient with the memory. Right on. Uh, we have a question from the Facebook feed. Uh, they asked, do you intend on uploading your code on GitHub or will you do that later on? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, yes, I want to share all of this, but uh, it's not public right now because it's very preliminary. So I think there, there is a lot of things that I need to improve first, but yes, eventually this will be available as part of the, of the manuscript. Okay, and we have another question from Matteo that said, um, I didn't see where there was seagrasses in your research. Did I miss them or will they come in the future? Uh, no, I mean, for now in, in this network that I'm presenting to you, the seagrass component, let's call it that way, it's basically that all of the invertebrates that I was using for the search are living in the seagrass environment, either in the sediment or within the sediment, but associated with seagrass beds. So, and after when we perform the the, the more extensive search, uh, we're also going to include invertebrates that are only associated to seagrass beds. One possibility, for example, that we were discussing at, at a certain time was to uh, try to distinguish between different species of seagrass beds to create also an additional node with it, uh, within the network. So you could have, for example, associations between uh, microbial groups, invertebrates and seagrass species. But so far it's only an idea that we need to explore. Oh, I can see a question here from Evangelia. Mm -hmm. uh, nope, not to any of those questions. I didn't use parallel programming and I didn't use a GPU. Um, I would love to explore the idea of uh, uh, parallelizing the code, but uh, it's something that I'm still learning. So I think that's also because uh, something that would help a lot to, to improve the the efficiency of the code, but so now it's it's very simple. We have another question from Bob on Facebook, uh, who says, perhaps it's not about the analysis, but I'm more interested and wonder when you collect samples for this purpose, how do you separate the outer microbial symbionts from the inner symbionts? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, well, it can be complicated depending on the organisms, uh, for example, on bivalves that uh, they are better studied, uh, the, these uh, microbes are specifically located in the gills of the bivalve. So you can dissect the organism and separate the, the gills from the rest of the body. And then you, that's how you can get a, a, a tissue that is enriched on the symbionts. Uh, for example, for other organisms like polychids, you can either try to <clears throat> rinse them or wash them to remove the epivions, and then also through the dissections, try to, for example, remove the, the intestinal tissue to make sure that you are having those specific microbes, but it depends on the organism. Okay, I see here a question from Laura. Uh, is GBK too fast useful to merge that biome data that can be got from sequencing and your metadata in order to have, a, for example, that CSV to be used in R? Um, I haven't used it for this dot biome data, but I suspect it, it, it can be useful because uh, it was designed, as far as I understand, to perform a much more complex task than uh, what I was doing. Actually, the, uh, what I, the, the reason that I used it was basically because uh, it was one of the typical tasks that, uh, well, one, one of the typical functions. So 
I'm sure that it can do much more complex things. And of course, it's free to download, so it, it's a matter of downloading it and trying to use it. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, so we'll give this another minute for uh, the other Facebook feed to catch up so everybody sees the answer and maybe we'll get more questions and then we can conclude these talks. Again, if anybody on Facebook uh, watching has any questions, I am monitoring that as well. So please feel free to ask any questions you have. Okay, it looks like that might be it. Are you good? Okay, good. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for uh, coming out. Thanks both of the speakers for, for coming and giving us awesome talks today. Uh, I do want to say we, um, we had it brought up in the Facebook feed that there's apparently a bunch of people who accessed the open feed and started spamming everybody with links. So do not open those links. You'll probably get a virus. Sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> um that that's on me next time i'll probably have to set the group to private so people don't share it uh, i should have saw that coming but you know live and learn uh all right so if there's no more questions for either of the speakers we'll finish this up for now and tomorrow we have uh more presentations at 11 o'clock so i will see you guys then Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks. See you.